Are any among you weary? Do you carry heavy burdens? Here, find a place of rest, a place to encounter Christ's healing and grace. Are you frantic and scattered, breathless in busyness? Find a place of deep peace. Here, come and know the unhurried God. Do any of you feel brittle or broken, thirsty for the gospel? Then come here and encounter Jesus, the living water. Feeling hollow and empty, Hungry for truth? This is where you will find Christ, the bread of life, nourishment for your journey. Let us pray. Holy God, together with you, we enter into this sacred time of worship. We come to you today as a consecrated people, a people that are dedicated for your purposes, we set apart this time and place in which we can renounce all of our other loyalties and all of our competing interests so that we might behold your glory yet again. Come to us. Take your rightful place within our hearts and our lives. Call us to remembrance, to wakefulness, to prayerfulness. Lead us into your holy mystery where abiding and not doing is your work and where listening rather than speaking is our food. In the depths of your grace, may we relinquish all of our fears so that we can be free to respond to your love with all of our being. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Hello and welcome to all of you who are joining us for this time of worship. It is our prayer that God's richest blessings would fall upon each and every one of you as we seek to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth this day. If this is your very first time visiting with us, we extend an especially warm welcome. If your viewing is of a more serial nature, we are, of course, thankful for your presence. It's our hope that you find something within our podcast today that will give you a blessing for the rest of the week. If you like what you see and hear this morning, uh, you can find additional podcasts of ours on our YouTube channel. If you will just log into YouTube, uh, type into the search dialog box, Altered States, that's A-L-T-A-R-E-D, Altered States, then it will take you right to the channel. And once you have done that, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to click that bell icon so that you can be notified the next time that new content is made available. In confusing and chaotic times like the ones in which we live, everybody can use a little bit of encouragement and a little bit of inspiration. And so we invite you to log on to our Facebook page and start every single day with one of our short devotionals as a matter of faith. On Facebook, just search for Hickory Ridge UMC. That's one word, Hickory Ridge UMC. And in about the amount of time it takes you to check your emails, you'll be able to get a little bit of an uplift for your day. So be sure and check us out on Facebook. One of the things that age has taught me is that transitioning to the second half of life tends to move one from an either-or kind of thinking to a both-and kind of thinking. As I've as I've gotten older, I find myself increasingly able to live with much more paradox and mystery than I was when I was younger. I really don't tend to think in terms of win and lose anymore, but rather in win-win. In order for this to become your primary way of thinking, you usually have to experience something that forces that either-or thinking strategy to fall apart. For me, I found that what served to break down my very natural egocentricity was the discovery that the qualities that I hated, that I hated in others were actually qualities I found that I hated within myself. I came to realize that I really wasn't as moral as I thought I was. 
like most everybody else, I have imagined doing bad things. And I have to admit, if I'm honest about it, that if I could have gotten away with it, there were probably a lot of times I would have, I would have done it. I suppose at some point or another, everybody would like to be Tony Soprano for about a day. I found that I didn't give in to the temptation because I was a moral person, but rather because I was afraid. Fear is not morality. Fear is not enlightenment. Fear is not that transformative state that we've been promised in Jesus Christ. Fear keeps us inside a false order. And it doesn't allow us to do any reordering of our lives. Unless you somehow are able to come to know and admit your own phoniness. Until you're able to weep over your own hypocrisy and fear and woundedness, it's likely that you're not ever going to get over that first half of your life. If you don't allow yourself this needed disappointment, if you surround yourself with your orthodoxies and certitudes and your belief that you're the best, then frankly you're going to stay locked in that first half of your life for the rest of your life. Most religious people I know never allow themselves to fall. While most of the sinners that I know fall over and over again and they rise over and over again. Our greatest sin is not in falling. Our greatest sin is not in failing but rather it's refusing to rise and to trust ourselves in God one more time. My children, make sure that you're always in need of mercy. And if you are, then you will never, ever, ever stop growing. God is a good and forgiving God. He's abounding in steadfast love for everyone who calls on his name. So let us confess our sin in humility and trust, knowing that God's ear inclines to that honest and heartfelt prayer. Gracious and most merciful God, we forget who we are. We get caught up in our own desires. We search for an easy way out of our human loneliness. We work too hard. We buy things we don't need. We look for love in all the wrong places. We forget that you're always there waiting for us to come to you. In fact, we very often reject your love. Be with us in our wanderings and our hurts. Help us in our misery to find you and then to tell others about your faithfulness. My children, God says that there's nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. When the truth of those words sinks in, when it gets through, then you become transformed. You're accepted and loved for who you are. You don't have to carry around burdens of the past. You're a new creation and the very powerful presence of God's constant love. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. And as Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes on our behalf, so we too, as the body of Christ, seek to intercede on behalf of those in our churches and those in our communities who are afflicted with illness and overcome with circumstances. If you have a particular need, one that you would like to have us pray for or to pray with you over, then you may send that request to us uh, at our email address. That's preacher.bob at aol.com. Preacher.bob at aol.com. Send us your prayer request, and we will be glad to lift your name up in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for all the gracious gifts that you give to us, for the gift of food and health, for every breath that we take, for freedom to choose, the gifts of your word, the power that you grant us through your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed when we consider just how you've entrusted so very much to us. As we live out our lives from day to day, help us, Lord, to be worthy of that trust. 
May we be a people who are unafraid to live as fully and richly as you would like for us to live. Help us, Lord, as followers of Christ, to multiply all that you've given us to risk spreading the word and maybe be misunderstood. To gamble by loving those whom others think worthy only of hate. To take chances by doing good to those who haven't done any good to us. Help us to be faith-filled and desire to increase your glory and your goodness in this world. Make us people who share in both word and deed that which you've given us. We pray for your church that is gathered today, both here and around the world, that it might encourage all of its members to discover, to develop, to use all of the gifts with which you have granted them, those of nature, those of grace. We pray for those who are sick in body or in spirit, those who are oppressed and heavy laden, those who are sick and despair, especially those whom we name in our hearts this morning. Lord, minister by your spirit and by us to all of those for whom we pray. Help us to walk faithfully in the path of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us how we are to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Although most of our gatherings and our services have been postponed in the interest of public health, the ministries of the church and community uh, and the needs that those ministries address, well, they continue. Those needs are still there and in many cases are even more severe now than they were before. So please don't forget to send your tithe, your contribution, your gift to so that these very vital ministries may continue. And it is our prayer that God would bless your generosity. Let us pray. Ever watching and knowing, God, we offer gratitude for your gifts, those daily gifts of life and breath for all the loving relationships that we experience. All we have comes from you. And with these gifts that we offer this morning, we say yes to your never-ending compassion and care. Pray that they would be dedicated to your service in feeding the hungry and comforting the sick and welcoming the stranger. For it is in Christ's name that we work and pray. Amen. As we begin our journey through the scriptures this morning, we start with text from the book of Genesis chapter 21 verses 8 through 21. And the baby grew and was weaned, and Abraham threw a big party on the day that Isaac was weaned. One day, Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian that she had born to Abraham poking fun at her son Isaac, and she told Abraham, says, you need to get rid of that slave woman and her son. No child of this slave is going to share an inheritance with my son Isaac. Well, that gave great pain to Abraham because, after all, Ishmael was his son too. But God spoke to Abraham and said, Don't feel badly about the boy and uh, your maid. Do whatever Sarah says. Your descendants will come through Isaac, but regarding your maid's son, be assured that I'll also develop a great nation from him, for he is your son as well. Abraham got up early the next morning, put some food together in a canteen of water for Hagar, put them on her back and sent her away with the child. She wandered off into the desert of Beersheba, and when the water was gone, she left the child under a shrub and went off about 50 yards or so. 
She said, I can't bear to watch my son die. And as she sat there, she broke into sobs. Meanwhile, God heard the child crying. The angel of God called from heaven to Hagar. Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy and knows the fix that he's in. So get up now, go get the boy, hold him tight. I'm going to make of him a great nation. And just then God opened her eyes and she looked and she saw a well of water. And she went to it, filled her canteen and gave the boy a long, cool drink. God was on the boy's side and he grew up. He lived out in the desert and became a skilled archer. He lived in the Paran wilderness and his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. And now we turn to Paul's first letter to the church at Rome. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. So what do we do? Do we keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? Well, I should hope not. See, if we've left the country where sin is sovereign, then how can we live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize that we packed up and left there for good? That's what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life and a new land. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we were lowered into the water, it's kind of like the burial of Jesus. And then when we're raised up out of the water, it's like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace, sovereign country. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life is nailed to the cross with Christ, a decisive end to that sin-miserable life, no longer that sins every beck and call. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him, but alive, he brings God down to us. So from now on, think about it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means absolutely nothing to you, but God speaks your mother tongue. And you hang on every single word. You are dead to sin, but you are alive to God. That's what Jesus did. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, come to quicken our minds and our hearts that we can receive the word as it is read and proclaimed today. Encourage or convict comfort or confront as you know that we need, feed us and teach us, empower us to respond in obedient faithfulness. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The scripture which I will be using as the focal point for the message this morning is from the 10th chapter of Matthew, chapter 24 through chapter 10, verses 24 through 39. A student does not get a better desk than the teacher. A laborer doesn't make more money than the boss. So be content, be pleased, even when you, my students, my harvest hands, get the very same treatment that I get. If they called me the master dung face, then what can the workers expect? Don't be intimidated. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open and everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There ain't nothing they can do to your soul anyway, your core being. Rather, save your fear for God who holds your entire life, body and soul, in his hands. What's the price of a pet canary? Some loose change, right? 
And God cares what happens to it even more than you do. He pays even greater attention to you down to the very last detail, even numbering the very hairs on your head. So don't be intimidated by bully talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. Stand up for me against world opinion and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. But now if you turn tail and run, you think I'm going to cover for you? You think I've come to make your life cozy? I've come to cut, to make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law, cut through these very cozy domestic arrangements and free you for God. Well-meaning family members can be your very worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, then you'll find both yourself and me. The Word of God for the people of God Thanks be to Almighty God. It has been said that a bald head is like heaven. There's no parting there either. That's just one of dozens of one-line zingers about baldness, but being the simple creatures that we are, That and others very immediately come to mind when we read this Bible passage about the hairs of our head being numbered. Kind of makes you wonder if Jesus could see what was in the minds of all the bald guys that were standing in the crowd. Now, it's obvious to even a casual observer that I am bald. But my baldness is by choice. I shave my head every single day. But now there are those folks out there for whom baldness is a matter of nature rather than a matter of choice. If you have bald head and you don't want to go through life with any of the other currently available methods for reforestation, that is either drugs or rugs or plugs, it might be best that you just embrace your baldness. That's what John Capps has done. See, John Capps could pass as the stunt double for an over-the-hill Mr. Clean. He's the founder of the Ball-Headed Men of America. It's an organization that has over 35,000 members in 50 states and 39 countries. They hold hold a, a, a convention every September in where else? Moorhead, North Carolina. I guess perhaps Baldhead Island wasn't available. This three-day event features clinics on caring for a bald head, awards for the sexiest bald head, the most improved bald head, the most distinguished bald head, and so on and so forth. Now, one of the great competition fringe benefits is that there is an all-female judging panel whose members regularly caress the competing scalps to judge how they feel. God, I love this country. In this text from Matthew, Jesus says that the very hairs on our head are numbered. Now, granted, counting the hairs on some heads is a lot less time consuming than counting the hairs on some others. But Jesus wasn't trying to be funny here, wasn't trying to make a joke. He was talking very seriously about the reality of those that participate in his mission and the fact that they would very likely be recipients of the same kind of hostility and rejection that he has experienced in his ministry. In fact, some of the leaders of that society had already branded Jesus as Beelzebub or as Satan. And if they were going to do that to uh, Jesus himself, then how much more likely are they going to do it to those who are allied with him? 
But in spite of all that, Jesus says, have no fear. In fact, as we go through this text, Jesus says to his disciples three different times, have no fear. They shouldn't have any fear because the purposes of God have been revealed. They should have no fear because God has God has control of the future. And three, they should not fear because God has control of the present. But now, in reality, isn't having no fear one of those things that's a lot more easily said than done? I mean, usually, I know for me, when I, I'm usually fine until somebody tells me that I shouldn't be afraid. And then, well, then it kind of dawns on me that they wouldn't say that unless there really was something out there to be afraid of. And that makes me afraid. FDR famously declared the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But I mean, who among us can really turn fear off when fear winds up having us in its grasp. It really doesn't matter if, if what we're afraid of is, is terrorism or illness or bad things happening to our children or the collapse of our retirement savings. Things like that sometimes literally have us incapacitated by fear. Now, Jesus' Jesus' comment about having no fear comes within the context of this sending out the disciples to preach and teach in the towns and villages of Galilee. And at the same time, as he's preparing them to, to preach and teach, he's also giving them instructions about persecutions. He says, see, I am sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves, Beware, because they're going to drag you before councils and they're going to flog you in their synagogues and they're going to drag you before governors and kings because of me. Because of our own experiences with fear, we can imagine something of the dread that these disciples probably felt as Jesus was getting ready to send them out. Especially as he went on to talk about all the threats and all the dangers that they were going to encounter. All the arrests, all the floggings, all the hatreds, all the betrayals. Not exactly a great incentive. But then he tells the disciples not to fear any of these things. Don't be bluffed into silence by the bullies. Not one thing they can do to your soul, your core being. Instead, save your fear for God. He's the one that holds your entire life, body and soul, in his hands. Now, these words give us an entirely different spin on this idea of fear from the one that, that we usually think about. Jesus is not trying to tell us that all we have to fear is fear itself, but rather to fear what is really deadly. Jesus here is talking about what really matters. He's talking about the importance of taking a long view. The worst that other people or troublesome circumstances do is, is still not nearly as bad as suffering a spiritual death. In so many words, God and not anybody else holds our ultimate destiny in his hand. So in the final analysis, only two events can befall his followers, either life or death. And in both of those, well, God has both those in control. So you say, well, okay, preacher, I get that. I understand. I know what Jesus is trying to, the point he's trying to get across. Trouble is, most of us really don't live in that long view. We live rather day by day. And from that particular vantage point, there's, a, there's an awful lot of scary stuff out there. When we're confronted by a threat, our natural impulse is not to sit back and say, oh, well, you know, whatever harm this situation can bring to me, I, 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 it will not destroy my soul, so I'm okay. That's really not how it works. We see the threat as something that's going to happen to our immediate circumstances. 
Our fear in the present is, is very palpable. It's not the least bit unreasonable. In fact, for most of us, fear of something is unavoidable. It is an involuntary response to threat. In fact, there are times when fear can even be a very positive thing because, uh, say, for instance, in, in, in the case of an immediate threat, fear often pushes us to either make that fight-or-flight decision, one of which may be an appropriate and even saving reaction of running away. Studies have shown that realistic fear appears to be healthy. I mean, let's face it, boys and girls, sometimes it'll keep us alive. Moderate levels of fear, however, have been associated with better adjustment to things like surgery rather than high or low fear levels. But the truth of the matter is, you and I both know that fear can actually paralyze us. It causes us to panic. It causes us to react in ways that actually can make things a lot worse than they are or we just don't think straight. Comedian Jerry Seinfeld refers to the irrational way that we address our phobias. According to most study, studies, he says, people's number one fear is speaking in public. Uh, the number two fear is death. Death is number two. Now, does that sound right to you? What this means is that for the average person, if you go to a funeral, you're a lot better being off in the casket than you are in doing the eulogy. Jesus' instructions to his disciples invite us to let a little bit of heavenly light shine on these, these earthbound hearts of ours. That won't call us to put all our circumstantially driven fears behind us, but it can lower the level that we feel level of fear that is inherent in a lot of the life situations that we encounter. And just so you know, there is a difference between be afraid, being afraid, and being fearful. See, we don't really have all that much control over our feelings. Feelings, 99% of the time, are just, they are what they are. But we do have choices about our attitudes and how we live. Feeling afraid is a very normal response. We, have a, we perceive a threat, and our response to that threat very naturally and, and involuntarily is fear. Being fearful is an attitude toward life. Now, a man, let's call Jack, used to manage a church camp which was a very popular site for not just summer children's programs, but also as uh, retreats for the rest of the year. The camp, as most camps are, was located out in a very heavily wooded area out by itself, and the main lodge was a considerable distance from the house that Jack lived in. And to keep expenses down, the camp didn't keep the lodge lit or keep the heat on unless it was going to be in use. So in the winter when darkness fell usually much earlier during the day, Jack often had to walk over to the lodge in the dark in order to turn on the lights and turn on the heat in preparation for a church group uh, to arrive. Most of the time, Jack was usually busy somewhere else in the camp when it got to be time to turn on the lights and turn on the heat, and so he didn't really take time to go all the way back to the house to get a flashlight, so he would walk to the lodge only able to see by the amount of moonlight that was there. And when he arrived at the dark lodge and was ready to open the door, there was always for him just that, that moment of uneasiness. The lodge wasn't kept locked, and there was always a possibility, no matter how slim, that somebody was going to be inside up to no good. And, of course, worst-case scenario, every time he would reach his hand in in the dark, that thought would cross his mind. It was a very realistic possibility. But always after recognizing the fear, Jack told himself that a scenario like that was, was very unlikely. He'd never had any trouble before. And so he would reach 
open the door, reach around to the light switch, and turn the hallway light on. Now, for Jack, the fear was real. But the decision to go into the lodge anyway meant that he was choosing not to act fearfully. When it comes to fear, there's always some choice as to how we're going to react. As we look at this text from Matthew, Jesus requires his disciples to face their fear, even at its possible worst, and proceed in the right direction anyway. Now, that's got applications for us in face of the problems that we face today. Those of us who follow Christ always ought to remind ourselves that the things we fear never have the final word in our lives. That's what Jesus was telling his disciples. He's getting ready to send them out into very potentially dangerous situations. I can imagine, I can imagine them praying, Lord, just don't let me be afraid. That prayer must have been answered because they all left and went forward. Jesus reassured them that God, whose eye was even on the canary, who even numbered the hairs on their head, would never leave them or desert them. And my children, that's the same is true for all of us that walk with Jesus. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God, not even fear itself. And not even those frightening things that actually happen to us. I will never leave you or forsake you. No one can remove, remove you from the palm of my hand. Let us pray. Lord, one of the problems we have with praying is that you always get too personal. We keep praying because your being personal is one of the joys of prayer. We thank you that we stand in a long line of believers who've been faithful through the ages. You've led your people through trial and difficulty and always have set before them hope for today and hope for a better tomorrow. We pray that you would bless us in our time as we seek to be faithful as our forebearers were. May we too know faith that is filled with hope of things not seen. Give to us a faith like a grain of mustard seed, which has small beginnings but yields such large results. Give to us the faith to move mountains of difficulty that come to reach out to us. Give to us the faith that sees the distant goal and is willing to work to achieve it. Give us faith to walk with you through the ebb and flow and the victories and defeats of life to achieve victory and mastery for life. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you are sent out as sheep in the midst of wolves, but God is with you, and evil cannot overcome. Do not be anxious about what you are to say or do, for the Spirit will speak and act through you. Do not grow weary in well-doing. Go forth in wisdom, witness to the truth, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.